Why are you calling me Lord, but you don't do the things which I say? So it sounds like to me that Jesus expected obedience out of his disciples. Would you agree? Amen. Then in Paul's letter to the church at Galatia, uh, these believers, Paul had taught them the redemptive truths. Uh, shortly after that, false teachers came in, began to teach other things, tried to convince them that Paul was not really an apostle, that he didn't really receive his message by revelation of Jesus Christ, and got them back in bondage. And listen to what Paul said in Galatians 5 and verse 7. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Amen. This is New Testament, folks. This is the Apostle Paul. By the way, the man who gave us the revelation on grace, he's saying, amen, he's saying, hey, folks, why did you stop obeying the truth? Well, I, o, obedience many times is an action word. You know, it, it demands action behind it. Now, does that mean I'm trying to work things up so that I can get God's approval? No, the Bible just simply tells me that I am to be a doer of the word. You remember we talked about all those ifs in the Old Testament? If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, if thou shalt observe to do all that he has commanded you, you can't even receive salvation without obeying an if. Romans 10, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart God's raised him from the dead, then here's what will happen. You shall be saved. Don't ignore the ifs in the Bible. <laughs> Amen. They set a condition. Once the condition is met, then praise God, get ready for prosperity. Get ready for blessing. Get ready for the miraculous. Can you say amen? amen? All right, let's get on the subject of a lifestyle of faith. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, the just shall live by faith? Amen. Anybody ever heard that? Amen. How many times is it spoken in the Bible? Anybody know? At least three times you'll find in the Bible, the just shall live by faith. So how does God expect us to live? By faith. By faith. By faith. Why is that so important? Because the Bible says in Hebrews 11:6, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, wouldn't you agree that it would be um, a little ridiculous for me to think that God's going to bless me, prosper me, if I'm not pleasing Him, if my lifestyle is not one that pleases God, how can I expect, you know, Him to answer all my prayers, fulfill all my petitions, pour out His blessings on me, if I know right up front I'm not even pleasing Him? And the Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith. Can you say amen? amen. Look at your neighbor and say, you're supposed to live by faith. Now, what does that mean, living by faith? I'd just like to give you a simple definition. It just simply means taking God at His Word. Taking God at His Word. God promised that He would bless and prosper Abraham. However, notice that the Bible says that Abraham believed God. He believed God. In Romans chapter 4, it says, because he believed God, God counted it unto him as righteousness. In other words, because Abraham dared to believe God, God looked upon him as a righteous man, a man having right standing with God. But notice, even Abraham's obedience was the result of, first of all, he believed God. He took God at his word. Now, that means that if we have faith in God, that simply means that we have determined that we're going to take God at His Word. That means we don't need any other evidence. I'm healed because the Bible says, by His stripes I'm healed. Not necessarily because I feel healed. There's not where I get my evidence. I don't look to my five physical senses to determine whether the Bible's true. Amen? Amen. The Bible says in Romans 4, 17, that God calleth things that be not as though they were. If I say I'm healed, and yet my body doesn't feel healed, if I say I'm healed, and yet I still have symptoms in my body, am I lying? No, I'm not speaking based on what is going on in my body. I'm speaking based on what the Word of God says. 
And the Bible says that by the stripes of Jesus, we were healed. Amen. So I'm calling things that be not as though they were. Hallelujah. I'm taking God at his word. Now, Jesus said that once the word is sown in a man's heart, Satan will come immediately to attempt to steal it. I remember when I first began learning these things back there in 1969, and I'm reading all those healing scriptures, like I said in one of the previous sessions. Eventually, my faith got very strong where divine health was concerned. I'm 67 years old. Uh, from 1969 to this present time, uh, at the time of the taping, 2014, I have spent very, very little money on doctors. Other than taking physicals, you know, uh, I did have a, a, a situation with my heart one time 20 years ago where I had some chest pain coming back from a meeting and found out that there was a, a slight blockage, one of the arteries, you know. I think that's the only time I've been in a hospital. I didn't have heart surgery, anything like that, you know. But I think that's the only time I've been in a hospital since 1969. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I've enjoyed divine health. Amen. I think another reason why I've enjoyed divine health, not only because I believe what God's Word said about it, but the Bible also says a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. I'm a happy guy. <laughs> Amen. I don't get down. I don't get depressed. I don't get sad. I, I have a joyful nature. Hallelujah. And I believe that merry heart I have has kept me in good health. Praise Amen. God. Amen. Amen. You can laugh your way into good health. You know that? <laughs> That's another sermon. Anyway, living by faith simply means that you have determined that God's Word is final authority. Have you heard me say that a few times in these sessions? That God's Word is final authority. Now, the Apostle Paul had this lifestyle of faith, one of the greatest men of faith that's ever been recorded. And his attitude was this, I know in whom I have believed. How many of you can say that today? I know in whom I have believed. You know, a lot of times people mistake faith for ego. They mistake faith for arrogance. In fact, I've said many times, if Paul was alive today, he would not be a member in good standing in many churches in America today because they would think he was egotistical, prideful, or arrogant because he went around saying, I know. Well, how do you know? I know because the Word says. Amen? I mean, that's, that's been something that we've been criticized about. We that you know, are known as faith preachers. We've been criticized about. Well, they just come in here with that attitude, you know, they just know. Well, I know that I know that I know because I found it out in the Bible, praise God. And I'm not going to compromise what I believe just so I can be in good stead with some denomination. They're not my source of supply. Amen. Amen. I'm not in this to win, you know, popularity contest. In fact, Smith Wigglesworth told a group of preachers one time, said, uh, when you boys went out and preached last time, did you make anybody mad? No. Did you make anybody glad? No. Go on home, you're not called. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you either make them glad or make them mad. That's how you know if you're called. Amen. <laughs> Sometimes you can make them glad and mad all in one service. You know. <laughs> so notice the life of faith is, is a life that, that causes a person to become very positive. Amen. Very positive. Not based on what they can do, but based on what God said he would do. And Paul said, I know in whom I have believed. And his attitude was, and I'm fully persuaded that he is able to do that which he has promised. And see, that's the life of faith. How many of you are fully persuaded that God is able to do what he promised? Amen. Well, we just read in some of our previous sessions that if I'm willing and obedient God will do what? He will cause me to live like a king. He will cause me to feast like a king. Eat the good of the land. So if I'm willing and obedient, if I take that word and make it final authority, that if I am willing and obedient, then God promises me that life will be good. Hallelujah. Yes. Then I don't need any other evidence. And I'm certainly not going to let some believers who tried it and it didn't work influenced me. 
You know, you hear that a lot. Well, we tried that and it didn't work. Well, I've been doing it for 45 years and it's still working. Why do I want to listen to them for it? Yeah. Amen. I realize sometimes it does sound like you're coming across arrogant, but it's not arrogance. It's knowing in whom you have believed. Yes. Amen. Amen. It's knowing in whom you have believed and being fully persuaded that he's able to perform that which he has promised. Paul had strong faith in God being able to bring to pass everything that he had promised. That's the reason while he was in prison, and he writes that letter to the church in Philippi. And, and from what I have been told and, and heard uh, one particular minister who, who did a lot of research on this, the prison he was in when he wrote that letter was the worst prison in existence. And yet, while he's in that prison, he writes to the church in Philippi and says in Philippians 1.19, I know this will turn to my salvation. I know. How could he be so sure? He's in the worst prison in existence. They're constantly threatening him with his life. And he says, I am not moved by this because I know this is going to turn. Yeah. Now, if you were to uh, send that letter and not... not put Bible reference to some churches in America today. I'm in the worst prison in America, and yet God's told me he's going to deliver me, so I know this will turn. They would think you were a fool. They would think you were arrogant, and they'd think you were prideful. But how could Paul be so positive? Because God's word was final authority. Amen. As far as he's concerned, I don't need any other evidence. I don't have anybody coming from the Roman government telling me, Paul, just hang on. One of these days, you're going to be out of here. Nobody said that to him. He wasn't depending on somebody from the Roman government. His total reliance was upon what God had said to him. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? That's developing a lifestyle of faith. Paul was convinced that if God said it, then he would do it. That's why Jesus often challenged the disciples, have faith in God. Mark the 11th chapter. Have faith in God. God wants His Word to become final authority in our lives. He wants us to get to the place where we believe it more than the Word of any other personality. Amen? Amen. Brother Copeland, first time I ever heard him, uh, and the message was called The Word of Faith. And in that message, he said, when you get to the point where you believe God's Word more than you believe the Word of your doctor, your lawyer, or your very best friend, then things will begin to happen in your life. Yeah, amen. amen. So that's what the faith life is about. God's Word is final authority. One of the greatest examples of this is found in Matthew chapter 8. Why don't we turn there for a moment? Matthew chapter 8. <clears throat> Excuse me. Beginning in verse 5, and when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou should come under my roof. Now, before we go any further, this man was correct in making that statement. A born again believer should never make that statement. And yet, the church world today will pray prayers like, Lord, I know I'm so unworthy. That is not true. To say you're unworthy is to deny what Jesus did at Calvary. Amen. 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 You were Amen. unworthy. But what he did at Calvary changed everything. Amen. 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 You're now the righteousness of God. Don't go around saying, I'm not worthy. Amen. Amen. You weren't, but now you're born again. And what happened? You became a new creation. The little Greek says, a new species of being that has never existed before. And this new species of being that has never existed before has right standing with God. Yes. Amen. Now this man, uh, in the mind of the Jew, he was considered a dog, an outsider. And that's the reason he said to Jesus, I know I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. But a New Testament believer should never make that statement. It sounds like humility. It is not humility. It's stupidity. 
Thank you for your enthusiasm. <laughs> Amen. So notice here, I'm not worthy that thou should come under my roof. But notice what he said. If you highlight your Bible, highlight this next phrase, underline it, draw circles around it, because this is faith at its best. Speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Yes. Speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Notice this man is saying, Jesus, you really don't even have to come to my house. You could stand right here, even though my house may be miles away. You could stand right here and just say, servant, be healed. And as far as I'm concerned, that settles it. Right. Speak yeah. the word only, and my servant shall be healed. What's he saying? I don't need any other evidence. I don't have to go check and see if anything happened. I don't have to feel and see if anything happened. I don't have to have 14 confirmations. Amen. You just speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. And then notice why he made that statement. He said, for I am a man under authority, having soldiers unto me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth. And to another come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. What is he saying? Jesus, I recognize that you are a man under authority of God, and I recognize that you are a man who has authority. I know authority when I see it because I am a man who commands people to do something and they do it. I command a person to go somewhere and they go. I command a person to come and they come. I recognize authority and authoritative words when I see them. Yeah. And I see that in you, so that's the reason I'm saying, speak the word only and it's done. And maybe that's the problem with a lot of Christians. They don't recognize the authority of God's Word yet. My God. To a lot of Christians, it's just a book full of stories. Mm. You know, the authority of the Word of God. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I tell you, that was one of the greatest revelations when I heard Kenneth Hagin and Kenneth Copeland preaching back there in 1969 on the authority of the Word of God. I'll never forget Brother Copeland holding that Bible up and saying, Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Word of God. Up to that time, it was a book to me, just a book, just a book with a black cover. Mama had one, a big one, on the coffee table. We never read it, but it sure looked good when people came over. Huh? He said, this is the Word of God. This is God's bond. This is His covenant with you. What he says you can do, you can do. What he says you can have, you can have. Amen? Amen. And that hit me. I mean, I'm sitting in that audience, and when he said that, it was like it was meant for nobody else in that building but me. It was like all those words just jumped in my heart, and all of a sudden I realized, my, 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 this is not just a book anymore. This is the Word of God. And it's got my name in the front. It's God's word to Jerry Savelle. Still brings tears to my eyes when that became a revelation to me, that this is God's word. And I knew from that moment, even though none of my circumstances changed when I first heard that, I still had all the debt. I still had all the challenges. I still had all the problems, but something inside changed. And I knew that I knew that I knew if I get this in my heart and learn how to operate in it, my days of poverty, sickness, disease, lack, and want were over. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Man, I'm telling you, it still blesses me when I think about the authority of God's Word. That's what the life of faith is all about. God's Word being final authority. If you keep reading this, Jesus turned to His disciples and said, that's the greatest faith I have seen I haven't even seen faith like this even in Israel. Yes. What is he saying? I should have been seeing faith like this in the synagogue, but it wasn't there. I should have been seeing faith like this among God's people, but it wasn't there. He said, here's this outsider who has just demonstrated the greatest faith. And what is the greatest faith? Needing no other evidence outside of the Word of God. Amen. That's the lifestyle of faith. 
Somebody say, well, how can you be so sure that God will meet your needs? Because Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply all my need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So I'm saying, God, you don't even have to come down to my house. Speak your word only. <laughs> Amen. Speak the word only. If I find it in the word, then as far as I'm concerned, that settles it. Amen. There was a slogan going around years ago that sounded good, but it wasn't accurate. It said, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. That is not true. God said it. That settles it. Well, you believe it or not. <laughs> You're believing it is to your advantage. Amen. Say it with me this way. God said it. God said that settles it. That settles it. I believe, it. I believe it. Come on, give him a shout of praise. I Amen. <clears throat> so if this, if this centurion, who was not even a born-again man, could have that kind of faith, look to your neighbor and say, what could you do? <laughs> Amen. If this man could have that kind of confidence in the authority of God's Word, then why can't we? You know, the problem is Satan, the world, and religion has programmed us to doubt. Yeah. Amen. To doubt the validity and the integrity of God's Word. Yeah. I've had people say to me, I don't understand, Jerry Savelle, how you can base your life on the Bible when it was written by men. Don't you know men are capable of making mistakes? Well, my Bible says that they were inspired by the Holy Ghost. Yeah. The Holy Ghost does not make mistakes. That's right. Amen. 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 They were under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. I just believe if God can take two words and create a universe, light be, surely he can get a man to write something that he wants him to write and write it correctly. Amen. 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 Not only that, but do you remember Jesus on the Mount of Temptation when Satan came against him and tempted him? Did you notice what Jesus used to retaliate? It is is written. Yes. What did Jesus quote? He was quoting Moses. What if Moses got it wrong? Jesus is basing his success on something a man wrote. Uh -huh. If Jesus can base his success on something Moses wrote, Jerry can base his success on something Paul wrote. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I just, you know, I'm just going to believe it regardless of what religion says about it or anybody else. Amen. That's the lifestyle of faith. Can you say amen? amen? Look at your neighbor and say, that's the way I'm living, praise God. I'm telling you, when you live by faith, what does it do? It pleases God. The Bible says when a man's ways please God, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. So when you're pleasing God, obviously you can expect the blessing, the favor, the prosperity, and all the wonderful things that go along with it to manifest in your life. Can you say Amen. amen. Abraham's faith brought him into a life of prosperity and success, and the same can be true for you and me. Can you say amen? amen. Praise God. In closing this session, uh, let me talk to you about three characteristics of the lifestyle of faith. Number one, faith is not need-minded. Real Bible faith is not need-minded. Number two, real Bible faith is seed-minded seed-minded. And then number three, real Bible faith always sees needs as an opportunity. Needs as an opportunity. Now let me illustrate that to you. I'll cover all three of these in one illustration. Years ago, we were building a medical facility in, in the nation of Kenya. Uh, the Lord had put it on my heart to build this facility in an area where there were nearly two million people without any medical facilities. We'd been planting churches there, uh, Bible schools, training the nationals and feeding the poor and all these kind of things. And, and then he, the Lord impressed upon me to build this medical facility. Oral Roberts found out about it and wanted to be involved. So he said, you build it and I'll staff it with doctors and nurses that are coming out of Oral Roberts University. And uh, he said, not only that, I'll equip it. And so we had a joint effort. My job was to build it, and he was going to equip it and staff it. And so uh, I met with the uh, government officials in Kenya, had a meeting with the president of Kenya, vice president, several cabinet members, 
They gave us land to do this on. And uh, then my job was to build the facility. And we began building a four-story facility with the clinic on the first two floors and the upper two floors would be where the doctors and their families uh, would live. And so we're believing God to pay for this. Now, a lot of people say, oh, probably didn't cost much to build a medical facility in a third world country. You never been. <laughs> Is that right, Joe? It cost a ton of money. And uh, so we're believing God to do this, and I'm believing God to pay cash for it as I go. So we're talking about a lot of money. And uh, man, it just looked like from the moment I decided to do it quickly and quietly, be obedient to God, I mean, money started coming in, and I'm telling you, it was amazing. I, we started this project. I sent a couple that worked for me over there to oversee it, and uh, we had several other Americans that went over to to be involved in the project. And boy, it's, it's going smoothly. Things are going well. Uh, the money's coming in. And uh, we think we've got it completed. Oral Roberts has got the doctors and nurses ready that he wants to send over there. The equipment's in. And we think it's ready. And Brother Roberts and I are going to go over along with the team and dedicate this facility. I get a call from my directors there. And they said, Brother Jerry, uh, there's something else the government is requiring and it's going to cost an additional $30,000 before you can have the, the certificate to operate. Well, I didn't have another $30,000. Man, I'd already spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars on this project, and I just didn't have another $30,000. We had some money that was designated for another project in another country, but I couldn't use that because the IRS considers that misappropriating funds, you know. And so I just didn't have another $30,000 to send. But then I got Oral Roberts, who's determined we're going on this date. And there's two people I don't disobey, God and Oral Roberts. You know. <laughs> and so, uh, man, he's putting the pressure on me. We got to do it on this date. And I said, Brother Roberts, we still have one more thing we've got to do, and I can't promise we're going on that date. He wouldn't, he wouldn't listen. He turned his head and wouldn't look at me. I, I grabbed him by the chin. I couldn't believe I did. I grabbed Brother R. Roberts by his chin and pulled him around and said, listen to me, we can't do it on that date. He said, I refuse to receive that. I thought, okay, we got to get it done. And, you know, and so uh, I left Brother Roberts in Tulsa. I came back home and we're starting the Believers Convention here in Fort Worth. You know, No, let me back up, back up. No, I left Brother Roberts and I'm going uh, to Tulsa. Brother Roberts actually and I met in Dallas. Now I'm flying to Tulsa to do a minister's meeting with Buddy and Pat Harrison. And so on the way up there, I'm in my airplane. I'm sitting back there. I got all this on my mind. Brother Roberts, well, I can't negotiate with him. You know, let's postpone it at least two weeks. No, we can't do that. I said, God, I'm sitting in the back of my airplane. Nobody else is there. And I'm just talking out loud, God. I've got to have an additional $30,000, and I've got to have it now. All right, now what am I doing? I'm talking needs. Everybody say, he's talking needs. He's talking needs. The Holy Spirit said to me, not audibly, but in here, when you get to Tulsa, there will be five preachers in that meeting who have all decided if they don't have a word from God during this meeting, they're leaving the ministry. And he said, you give all five of them one of your suits. Call them out, lay hands on them, and put one of your suits on all five of them. And the spirit of longevity that's in you will come on them. I said, okay. We flew a little further, and I said, God, uh, I need to talk to you about that $30,000. <laughs> he said, when you get to Tulsa, There'll be a couple there, an elderly couple, who have a ministry of distributing food to the poor, and they need a new van, a maxi van. We had just bought two new maxi vans for our ministry. He said, give them one of your new maxi vans. I said, okay. So we flew a little further. I said, God, we need $30,000. He said, when you get to Tulsa, I said, I don't want to talk to you no more. <laughs> He said, there's a minister, and he told me what he was going through, and he said, 
you give him your briefcase and put $500 cash in it and it'll encourage him and he won't leave the ministry. Now what's happening? Every time I talk to God about a need, what did he talk to me about? A seed. Did you get that? Every time I talk to God about a need, he talked to me about a seed. Now I knew that. I've lived that way. But you know, at that moment, because of pressure, everybody say pressure. pressure. I became what? Need minded. I knew better than that. I know how God operates. But because of the pressure, I became need minded. And what God was endeavoring to show me is, son, real Bible faith is not need minded. Real Bible faith is seed minded. Yes. A need to real Bible faith is just an opportunity for a blessing, for a breakthrough, for a miracle. Amen. So when I got to Tulsa, they turned the service over to me and I started preaching. The Lord said, do it now. So I stopped and I said, there's a couple in here that are believing for a new maxi van so you can distribute food to the poor in your community. Would you please come up? This couple came up and I said, we just bought your van about two weeks ago. Thought it was for our ministry, but apparently it's for yours. Come to Fort Worth and I'm giving it to you. Oh, they shouted and praised God. Yeah. Said there's five preachers in here and you all came uh, saying if you didn't get a word from God during this meeting, you were leaving the ministry. Will all five of you preachers come up? They all came up and miraculously, they were all my size. <laughs> Not a tall one in the bunch. And I told them what the Lord said and I blessed each one of them with a suit and I might add, they're all five still in the ministry today. And then I did what the Lord told me to do with the briefcase and the $500, okay? So I, I planted my seed. I got on my airplane and flew back home. <clears throat> Didn't say another word about my need. <laughs> what did I do? I started thanking God Amen. that my need is met. Yes. I had my seed in the ground. I knew God is a God who is faithful to his word. I got back home. We started the Fort Worth Convention. The opening night after Brother Copeland got through preaching, I hadn't told a soul about this need in that convention. This is the opening night. When Brother Copeland got through preaching, we all went to the elevator at the uh, Worthington Hotel. Jesse, Kathy, uh, Brother Copeland, Gloria, uh, I think Happy and Jeannie Caldwell, and uh, John Copeland, his wife, Marty. We all got in the elevator, and the doors were closing, and just before they completely closed, two little hands came in trying to open the door. And I could tell it was a woman's hands, and I pushed the button for open, and it opened, and this woman got on and said, thank you. She's in a jogging suit. She didn't have a purse with her. She didn't have a Bible with her. She's just in a jogging suit. I just assumed she was somebody staying in the hotel and had gone out for a walk or a jog in the gym or, you know, a jog or go to the gym or something. She didn't even look like she had been to the convention. And so she stood there, pushed the button for her floor. She heard all of us talking, you know, and Brother Copeland didn't finish his sermon, so he finished it in the elevator. <laughs> and... Uh, when her, when her floor came and the door opened, she was about to get out. And then she stopped and she turned around. She said, oh, Brother Jerry, God told me this would happen. And she reached in her pocket, handed me a check and said, I knew this was going to happen. And she started walking off. The doors are closing before I could even say, well, thank you. And the doors closed. Now I got this check in my hand. Everybody in the elevator, you know, inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> Open the check, $30,000. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Now you say, what a coincidence. Well, it would be if things like that only happened once. But when God does it over and over and over and over and over, honoring your faith, then it's not a coincidence. It's God keeping his word. Amen. The lifestyle of faith, I'm telling you, will put you in a position where prosperity and success become a way of life for you. Amen. What's the lifestyle of faith? simply determining that the Word of God is final authority in every area, in every matter, in every situation. Amen. This concludes our study on uh, the lifestyle of faith. Our next session, Developing a Lifestyle of Giving. Thank you.
Was that good? How can you not believe the word of God? It's the truth. And the truth will set you free. You don't have to sit and think on that for hours. Just be a doer of the word. Is it cold in here? Are you comfortable? You're cold? Everybody is good to go. Now, <laughs> in <laughs> get a blanket. Okay, Romans 4, 3 says, For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now remember, even Abraham messed up when God called him away from his family, Abram, till he changed his not mind or changed his name. It took him five years to leave. Disobedience, right? Well, recompense the Arabs. What you sow, you're going to reap. Old Testament. So now, because God knew Abraham would believe him and be obedient, even though he messed up, he'd be obedient. God chose him to be the man to whom he would establish his covenant of blessing for his people and indeed for all people who would accept this, his covenant by faith. In this covenant, which means contract or agreement, I have a contract with God. You have a contract with God because you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So God promised that if Abraham would obey and serve him, God would abundantly bless not only him, but his seed as well. Who is his seed? That would be us because the father of Abraham. So now it says, Romans 4.13, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham, but to what? To his seed. Got it? Through the law, which through the righteousness of God. So it wasn't through the law, the Old Testament. It was through the righteousness of Jesus. So in other words, God's promise that Abraham and his seed would inherit the world. And that's exactly what we got through Jesus Christ. Now, Galatians 3.29 says, If you belong to Christ, then you have become the true child of God, of Abraham. What God promised to him is now yours. What did Abraham have? He had it all. He was a very, I mean, he, the boy was a billionaire. Because of his obedience, he kept on expanding his territory. So Galatians 3.11 says, New King James, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evidence for the just shall live by faith. So we're not justified because of the Ten Commandments. We are justified by faith, and that's what Abraham was justified, is by his faith to believe God. All right? So now, to develop a lifestyle of faith and obtain all God has uh, promised us, like he said, there's three things. Number one, Faith is not need-minded. Faith is seed-minded. And now you've heard Jerry. Number three, faith always sees needs as opportunity to prosper. But the world looks at it the opposite, don't they? If, if, if God, you give me something, I'll give back. No, no, you heard what Jerry said, didn't you? You're looking for opportunity to give, but sometimes what we do, and I'm guilty of this as well, we keep it and spend it on ourselves, and then we wonder, why are we always in turmoil? Why is our family in turmoil? Because we try to meet, meet our need, but we really didn't get everything God has for us. Remember, he's a God of overflow. So God is not a God of what? Need-minded. He's a God of seed-minded just like the farmer sowing. So when God has need, he had a need of his own, didn't he? He fulfilled those needs by giving. He needed the redemption of mankind. He needed a family. So what did he do? He planted a seed, and what was his seed? What was God's seed? Jesus. He planted the very best that he had. It's like if you have girls you have two nice pair of shoes and you favor one over the other and you know that person would really want those favorite ones what are you going to do give it so God can give you remember when you get your give your best you get back the best okay do you remember what Copeland did with the airplane 
What did he do? When he was going to give away an airplane, he told them, I'm going to give an airplane. And Jerry wondered, oh, okay. And he said, now I have to get it all fixed up. And he wondered, why would I get it all fixed up? Because he said, if I give junk, I'm going to get junk. You want to always get, and it, you know, when the first time we heard that, I was like, wow, that is cool. So if we have something, aren't we going to polish it up, fix it up? If we're going to give somebody a car or give, I don't care if it's that pair of shoes, guys or gals, you want to clean them up, polish them up, get them so that you'll get the best back, isn't it? Now, remember 1 Kings 17? It's talking about the woman that sowed a seed into the man of God, Elijah. And she, as he came along, she just had a little cruise of oil, and what did she need? Well, she was going to, she had a need. She looked at her need. She said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix this, this flour and oil, and then my son and I are going to die. And what did the man of God say, the prophet? He said, give it to me first so that God can give back to you. And until the end of that famine, she, famine, she lived in overflow. See, it's, it's totally different than what we think, isn't it? But if we get on God's way, because, guys, I get guilty of this. Once in a while, I get a little stingy. You know, and I think, oh, I'd like this and that. You know what I'm talking about, don't y'all? You do? Yeah. And then I'm like, oh, I got to have this and this and this. But I don't realize at the time. So listening to this really, it really jerked the slack out of me. Not to be need-minded, but when you see a need, it's an opportunity to sow a seed. That's God's word. So now if you say, I believe God's word, then you believe God and you'll do it his way so that you and your children and your grandchildren can have recompense of reward. So we're to develop a lifestyle of faith and obtain all God has promised for us. So remember those three things. Faith is not, uh, I'm sorry, faith is not need-minded. Faith is seed-minded. Third, faith always sees needs as an opportunity to, to prosper. Makes sense, doesn't it? So this is our opportunity to give. And even last night, uh, the Lord said to me, this is what I want you to give. And the first thing I want to do is, I said, no, no problem. Give and you shall receive. How much? pressed down, shaken together, and running over. God's not trying to get your money from you. He's trying to get provisions. He's trying to get wealth. He's trying to multiply things back to us, but we close up our mind because of stinginess. But you know what? You're closing your hand to God, not to man, but to God. I don't want to get caught in that rat race. And the Lord said to me, you know, many of you have given Expect to receive. Look how you got started with the word of faith message. And you started giving and giving. And what happened? Look at yourselves today. Don't stop doing it his way. So you can have the overflow. Okay? So let's do that right now. Let's come up. Debbie, you've got a song for us, ma'am. I'm a little bit in the way, but we'll do fine. Just put it right there.
Come on, church, let's rock this house tonight. Jesus is that rock. Let's lift this thing on high. Come on, church, rock this house tonight. Father, you're so good to us. You just bless us. Father, when we have a need, you take care of that need. All we need is our faith, Father. We put our faith to work, and you do the work in, the, in that place, Father. Father, we thank you for it, Father. Father, you know, the, world's, the world, you look at the world, and you see a lot of people with lots of money and th things. They, they think that they have insurance, but they really don't. We have, we don't have insurance, we have assurance Amen. in God's word. And so we just praise you and thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, we need communion. I'll make these ushers speed it up a little bit. We're going to take communion because now we just gave, we gave ourselves to the Lord. Is that true? And when you give yourself unto the Lord, what happens? He says, now what do you want? right you sow a seed he'll meet your need i need this here oops i need some help steve when you take communion what are you doing again when you take communion you have just given yourself in your tithes and offerings and now he's saying, what did I do for you? He is saying that he has healed your body. He has taken care of every need you have. It's already finished. He's just waiting for you to give and then so that you can receive. It's opening the windows of heaven. Let's eat in the name of Jesus. And then also Jesus, his blood was poured out onto this earth. Why would that happen? Because he purified this earth for the born-again Christian so that we could have everything. Remember, Father God gave it to his son Jesus. Jesus turned around and he gave it to us. We receive. Say, I am the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. I have favor everywhere I go. I have favor everywhere I go. 
I have a favor shield that surrounds me. The first thing people come in contact with, ooh, they see my favor shield. Amen. Remember, if two or more agree together on earth, on anything, he said, it shall be done. He didn't say, if it shall be done. He said, if you agree, it shall be done on this earth for you in Jesus' name. Let's drink. Father, you are a good God. There is no God like you. How does God say to do it? When you see something in the word, when you see, what, do you, what does it say? Quickly and quietly. We've got that, don't we? We don't say, well, Pastor Jan, um, um, no, I just took that from the word. I just showed you that. Okay, thank you, Pastor Jan. Quickly and quietly. Would that be true? See, what God is doing is looking for people that he can trust. We already know we can trust him. He's looking. Are we obedient? Is that true? Are we going to make mistakes? Yes. Did Abram make mistakes? Yes. Did God throw him out? Absolutely not. He finally got the message what to do, didn't he? But remember, he was from the Old Testament, so that's why he didn't go into the promised land. The promised land was for the New Testament. He represented the Mosaic Law, the Ten Commandments, but he got to look in, and God took care of him specially in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you so much. I give you the glory. I give you the honor. Oh, God, you're just, thank you, Daddy. I just can't help but love you. You're just so precious. You're so wonderful. Say this, say, God needs, meets my seed, not my need. I receive it in Jesus' name. Now I plead the blood of Jesus over each and every one here. And I call you blessed going in and blessed going out. You're the head and not the tail. You're above and not beneath in Jesus' name. Do you agree? Kim, would you please come up? I'm getting a tap here. All right, you can be seated. No. All right, we'll quickly go over announcements. Remember our website? That's where calendar of events, sermons, all that kind of stuff. Information from health classes on there. There's the website. If you don't want to wait for the sermon to be uploaded, you can check out our YouTube channel by Sunday, Sunday evening. The services are up there. Just search ESCF Church and you'll find us. Women's Bible study this 30, Thursday at 9.30. Remember to bring your, what is it, Live It, Dream It, Pin It books. Dream. There we go. I just had a little reverse. Bring that along. We're in the Super Kid room. There is child care available for a small fee. All right, uh, El Shaddai Christian Academy is still enrolling, six weeks to two years old. If you have any questions, see Megan or Keisha. And we are still continuing to give into Rescue Life Ministry. That is James and Betty Robinson's ministry for saving girls and women out of sex slave trafficking. If you want more information, Liberty Council has excellent, excellent website on that with lots and lots of information. Just type in Liberty Council and you'll find that. Our next health and wellness class is May 9th. It is going to be continuing on with our subject from last uh, this month, the Beamer. So come prepared to listen and invite anybody that you know that you think can benefit from it. And we have birthdays this week. Today is Miss Carrie's birthday. She is back teaching Sunday school. And Eric's birthday. And I didn't see Eric here either. So I guess we won't sing happy birthday because nobody's in here. But when you see Carrie, say happy birthday to her. I'm sure she'll enjoy that. She's 19 today. Oh, to Eric, how old is Eric? A prime number. <laughs> 19. Well, he's above 19. Yeah. All righty. And anniversary, Steve and Keisha's anniversary. How many years, Steve? Eight years. Congratulations. <laughs> and as we finish our announcements, let's pray for our military and our police. Please pray this with me. Father, in Jesus' name, we exercise our covenant authority over the enemy.
We demand the killing, destruction, and confusion over American soldiers, our police, and all who stand with them to stop now. We charge angels to protect and guide them, and we speak the blood of Jesus and the protection of the 91st Psalm over them now. Jesus is Lord over Iraq, Afghanistan, the United States of America, and all the earth. Amen. And that's all I have for announcements. So Now you know we're going to have beautiful weather today. So stand up so you're ready to go and have a beautiful day. You ready for it? Say in Jesus' name. I'm the righteousness of God. Everybody loves me. I have favor all the time. Just like Jesus did. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.